So the third piece for me, I agonised over this one because I've always loved improvised music. I kind of stumbled across it. I was kind of looking as a teenager for kind of the cool scenes to be part of, the music that really belonged to me. And punk came along when I was in my late teens, so that was my kind of identity. But before that, I got very interested in, in jazz. And I liked that sense of exclusivity, that you were almost learning some codes to enjoy music. I think it's a very common thing in teenagers to feel that you, 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 you want that sense of ownership. And some people perhaps never leave it behind. But the bit of jazz that I really enjoyed, I was lucky enough to be listening to live music in a time when people like Evan Parker were creating really exciting, powerful improvisers, mature improvisers who could really develop lots of different languages and use them in different ways. And again, that sense of music that could only create, uh, be created in the moment was so exciting because I'd listened to everything on records. I lived in a small village and records and that sense of permanence were the thing that I'd known. And suddenly there was a completely different way of, of, of looking at music. And I thought about choosing one of those improvisers, but the truth is, it was best, that music was best experienced at, at the moment. And then I remembered how can were so important to me. None of my friends understood free improvisation. They really hated it. You know, they would only come along under duress. But I could take them to a can gig because it was loud and there were rock bands and it happened in places that they kind of recognised. So me and my friends would go and see can a lot. And I remember Jackie Lieberzeit, the drummer, would always start just with one simple, loud stroke of the drum and then the music would open out from there and they would pick up the threads and they would wind them together and there would be a glorious simplicity from what was often very complex and very spontaneous music that was being made. And I found that thread again has, has defined all the music that I'm interested in, you know, that, that I'm really not interested in complexity for its own sake, but I love that sense that music might go to places you've never quite explored. But at the moment, I always look in the music I enjoy now for that, that heartbeat, that sense of a, of a really strong emotional connection. And I thought about choosing a can track that I particularly enjoy, but I felt that was rooting everything back a very long time ago. So I wanted to talk about a piece of music that I discovered relatively recently. I've worked with the Kronos Quartet for ooh, nearly 25 years now, and that's been a very exciting journey. I've been able to bring ideas that they have commissioned, that we've commissioned, new collaborations, but I've also had the honour to present some of the great works of the contemporary string quartet repertoire that they've performed. And of course they've gone off to literally hundreds of different composers and created amazing music. And one of their long-standing uh, collaborations has been with Clint Mansell, um, who's the leader of Pop Will Eat Itself. And uh, for the feature film, The Fountain, he wrote a piece called uh, Death is the Road to Awe. I can never hold that title in my mind. Death is the Road to Awe. And Death is the Road to Awe sounds so simple. It just sounds like a simple melodic line, the kind of thing that someone like Goretzky might write. But within the piece, which is about 10 minutes long, he draws in all sorts of elements. You know, the amplification, the kind of track that has Mogwai, uh, the, the Scottish rock band, colliding with Kronos Quartet, is an integral part of how the music's made. And then near the end of this piece, there's a piece, it's like, if you can imagine a jet engine that's pushed into uh, sort of supercharge, it goes to a, a truly extraordinary pace, which Kronos usually stage wonderfully. And every time I hear that piece, and I've heard it a lot, I think, I know this piece, I know where it's going to get me. And, and every single time it catches me viscerally and it does something really exciting um, that I can never grow tired of. So I think, you know, that this, this one piece of music almost represents uh, everything that I've heard that has taken me through African music, Asian music, all the musics of the world. And I've realised that is fundamental of the thing that I'm looking for in good music.